Greetings. My name is Karen Bandine Roach. I'm the Frank Hurley and Catherine Dorier Professor and Chair of Biostatistics at Johns Hopkins. And it's my pleasure to be with you today to go over a very brief module to introduce competing risks analysis. So with that introduction, here's our lecture objectives for the rest of this brief module. I want you to be able to recognize an analog to Kaplan and Meyer analysis, which is appropriate in the competing risk setting. That is to estimate the cumulative incidence function, but to find a different way than we did it in the survival setting a few slides ago. Second, to be able to interpret an analog to the Cox proportional hazards model, which is a cause specific hazard regression. And then finally, just to, at a very high level, be able to identify a few other competing risk regression approaches than cause specific hazard modeling. So let's begin with cumulative incidence analysis. And so we have to first carefully define what is the cumulative incidence function with competing risks. It's not what people often a bit carelessly will define it on based on regular old survival analysis. So once again, let's define T as the time to the event that we care about. Um, but really here, we're defining it as the time of the first failure among all of the competing possibilities. And then we're gonna define another variable K as the cause of that first failure among the various competing risks that could have caused that failure. Once I have those quantities, I then can define the cumulative incidence of each little k event time up to each benchmark t. So I'm calling that i for incidence, i sub k for the little k cause up to time t. And really the thing to focus on is in the bold maroon type that you see there. It's defined as the probability of failure at or before a given time. So far, that looks like what we had before. But also that that failure was due to the cause little k that this incidence function is characterizing. So that thing is called a subdistribution. It's a joint probability the probability of failing at or before t, and that the failure cause was little k, the one that I'm interested in for this particular incidence function. I can define one of those for every possible cause. Every k equals little k equals one up to capital K, say the total number. And then the overall probability of failing before, at or before t due to any of the causes is just the sum over all of the cause specific cumulative incidence functions. And then commensurately, the survival function is one minus that, one minus the probability of having already failed due to any of the causes. Now, the next thing is really important. Neither the Kaplan Meyer technique nor one minus that is valid for characterizing the competing risk quantities we've just um, defined. So even if you somehow want to get at the survival function for the cause, the Kaplan-Meier doesn't estimate that. Rather, it estimates a, a counterfactual, you know, that, that sort of is the probability at any given t of not having yet failed as if events could still occur after the competing risk. And again, assuming uh, independence of hazards at the same rate as those free of the competing risks. So first of all, it's something that doesn't exist and it's probably invalid even if it could exist because it makes the independent censoring assumption. And then similarly, one minus the Kaplan-Meier doesn't estimate the cumulative incidence for any specific cause. It actually has sort of the wrong risk set. So what do we do instead? Well, the first thing is to use a specialty regression model, which we'll describe briefly later. 
But there is a direct way to estimate the cumulative incidence function for a specific competing risk, um, which was described by Robert Gray. I've given you the um, analysis, the paper at the bottom of this slide. And so that is to leverage the cause specific hazard function, which again, I've put in, in maroon. So remember the hazard is like the instantaneous probability of failure among those surviving up until right before the instant at which failure is being adjudicated. That can be defined as the instantaneous failure probability or density function, which I'm calling F sub K here, divided by the overall survival function, where here F sub K is the instantaneous probability of failure due to the case cause. And so overall, the cause specific hazard is what's on the first sub bullet. It's the instantaneous probability of failure due to the case cause among those still failure free. That's the hazard, uh, the cause specific hazard. And so if you look at that thing in maroon, well, I can then um, the thing in maroon and the formula for the cause specific density, which follows it, that derivative of the uh, cumulative incidence function, I can put that all together to solve for the cumulative incidence function, and that's given in the second sub bullet. I can get that just by integrating the cause specific hazard over the overall survival function. And so if you follow these details or not, it turns out that there's a pretty easy plug-in estimator by which you can estimate the cumulative incidence function. For the survival function under that, underneath that integral, you, you actually just plug in the Kaplan-Meier estimate. And then one needs a hazard estimate, which is basically just the fraction failing due to the cause of interest at any given time, divided by the number who haven't failed of any cause yet. And then finally, there's an analog to the log rank test, um, which itself was provided by Gray in this um, 1988 article referenced at the bottom of this slide. So how would you implement this? The, this can be implemented in any credible uh, statistical package. I'm giving you the Stata implementation commands here just to give you an idea of how you would do it. So there's an overarching command, STCRR reg, that's for competing risks regression. Um, and so one would run that and then type the command CIF following that. And so begin by declaring the data to be survival time data. Um, that's the same way as you would do in any survival analysis. Then fit a competing risks model. And so you can see here, I'm um, pretending as if I were um, fitting a regression of, um, say, time to severe disease, treating death and discharge as a competing risk, as in terms of being female and non-white. Um, and then one defines what the competing risk is um, so here, maybe the, the competing risk would be death. And the failure type of interest in the previous uh, bullet would maybe be severe disease. And then one can compare cumulative incidence functions um, for um, two groups with remaining covariates held at their mean values using the final command that you see using ST curve together with CIF. If one doesn't wish to compare by covariates, then in the upper command, one would just type STCRREG without any covariates following. And so here's an example actually from our Johns Hopkins Hospital COVID-19 data. So you can see what um, a cumulative incidence curve looks like. Here, we are defining the cumulative incidence curve for onset of severe disease, treating both death and discharge as competing. This was from an overall model, so no covariates would have been listed. 
And, and the shape is very typical where you see there's sort of an asymptote. Not everyone will ever get severe disease ever before dying or before being discharged. So there's sort of a ceiling that this function can achieve, which seems in this case to be a, a little bit less than 30% of those hospitalized. Um, now, two overlays on top of a basic single curve like this often are useful. The first is to plot multiple risks on a single plot. And very often people will do this additively. So I want, if I wanted to add death, for example, death before severe disease to this plot, very often I would do it by a second curve that lies above the first one, such that the space in between characterizes the cumulative incidence of death and the overall height would be death or severe disease. The second type of overlay is to put multiple groups on a single plot so that one can compare cumulative in incidents of a specific event between groups. And so I have that on the next slide. You can see here um, is a, uh, from an early version of the Johns Hopkins Hospital data characterizing um, death before discharge. So discharge is the competing event. Death is the event of interest. On the left, you can see comparison by age groups. So all of them max out, but you can see that among oldest old individuals, the problem cumulative incidence was actually quite high, um, you know, getting into the, the lower um, 30%. Whereas you can see going to younger ages that it was quite a bit lower, um, particularly among those lower, younger than 60. On the right, you can see for the same outcome, death before discharge, comparing males and females, um, a little bit higher for males, but maybe not by as much as one would expect. All right, and so, um, Let's go on now and talk about regression. To motivate this, we need to um, revisit the cost proportional hazards model as a reminder, because you're going to see what we're going to do is going to be very close to this. So for the Cox proportional hazards model, the hazard function, again, that's the instantaneous probability of failure among those who haven't failed yet, is described as a product of, first of all, a baseline hazard, that's the curve that how the hazard evolves with time for a reference individual, and then an exponentiated term in, uh, in terms of covariates. And so basically the hazard is just multiplied everywhere for one covariate value versus another. That's where the proportionality um, concept comes from. So for example, if x1 was 1 for females and uh, 0 for males, the baseline hazard would be multiplied by a factor of e to the beta 1 for females as compared to males. Beautiful thing about the Cox model, one doesn't have to know the baseline hazard function in order to estimate the coefficients. It's one of the things that's made it so popular. Then, so long as independent censoring holds, again, exponentiated coefficient is just characterizing the relative failure hazard for a one unit increase in that covariate versus one unit less, holding all of the other covariates constant. It's a relative risk. And the ease of implementation has made the Cox model like the t-test of survival analysis. So how are we going to augment that to the competing risks setting so as to perform a cause-specific hazards regression instead? The beautiful thing is that this technique can be implemented using the Cox model machinery. Literally, one would just use exactly the Cox model software. The key is how does one define the censoring? And that is that we treat failures due to causes other than the one of interest as censoring. And so it is actually the naive thing. 
the key is how does one then interpret the resulting coefficients. So if one does as I've just described, Cox regression on the event of interest treating all other causes than the one of interest as censoring, this will characterize the cause specific hazard function. That was beautifully laid out in the paper by Prentice, which was distributed to you beforehand. The citation is listed at the bottom of this slide. And so we're characterizing the cause specific hazard in terms of a baseline cause specific hazard. And then once again, multiplicative factors um, for the contributions of other covariates. On the next slide, I see there's a, a typo that should be E to the beta J, not just beta J itself. So E to the beta J now equals for a one unit increase in XJ, the relative hazard of failing first due to cause K holding all of the other covariates constant. And so that's the part of the interpretation that's very, very important. It's a relative hazard of failing due to cause K, which, which specifically means failing due to cause K before any of the other failure causes happens. So bottom line, same method, different interpretation. And for this method to be fully useful, one really wants to compare results for each index cause um, so that one can see what happens across those causes. And I'll show you sort of an example of that here. <laughs> 